your life. That you yourself and the life that you lead is a powerful, powerful changer for your button pusher. Because believe it or not, you affect that person by who you are. See, one of the things when people who have a difficult person come to me and talk is that they'll always say this is like, nothing I say helps. They're like a train going off the cliff. I could be screaming and yelling, nothing helps. And then as we get into it, we find out, no, there's lots of things that they do that they, haven't, that they could do they haven't been doing. Because the reality is, your button pusher, if they're in your life, they need something from you. And that's a very simple truth, but think about it and ponder on it and kind of noodle about it. Your button pusher needs something from you. They may not need what you want them to need. You know, you want them to need your love and your support and your wisdom and all that. They may need a check. We have uh, two labs at my house, and um, it's so funny. They're very loving dogs, out of control, but loving. B but my wife and my kids have this joke that when the dogs come in the house and we have them in a certain section of the house so they won't kill everything and knock everything over, if we bring treats in, you know, and you're playing with your dog, if one person is playing with the dog and then, or the dogs, and another person comes in with treats, guess what happens? Who do they go to? The person with the treats is all of a sudden the most wonderful person in the world. And if you're playing with them and you're rubbing them and then, you know, somebody comes in with a treat, it's just like, you just abandoned me. And, and we'll always say things like, yeah, these dogs are really in a relationship. Yeah, they're relational dogs. They love you because of your inner child, don't they? They love you because of that spark in you. No, they love the food. I mean, God made them that way. After the food's gone, then they come back to relationship. Your button pusher is sort of a lab in that they need something from you. Maybe they need the fact that you, I don't know, maybe you're a structured person and you have a lot of your, you know, dependability and reliability and you do things like fill up gas tanks and you have a job, you know, weird things like that. But you have something they need. Or maybe you're a steady, warm person. They've had a lot of inconsistency and they need a lot of, they need somebody like you who's, there and can be there. Those are good things. Point is, your life matters. So the first thing is to reclaim your happiness. Reclaim your happiness. And I mentioned earlier how God's not dependent on your button pusher to be happy, to be, you know, to have a fulfilled life, if you can describe God that way. But we do that. We will give our meaning in life our sense of success and fulfillment in life, all that will go on the back burner for this crisis. And, you know, don't get me wrong. I mean, there are certainly some times when there's a crisis. You do have to hunker down and just live second to second and day to day, you know, until the crisis is over. Some of y'all might be in that. And some of you are kind of like, no, I'm past that now. I can think about more important things. But look at how how you have had what we would call in psychology a regressive wish. And the regressive wish is that if you will love me, I'll be happy. And if you don't love me, I'm not happy. And that's a very, very common thing that people do who have a button pusher in their life. It's like an, an algebraic equation. Now, you come by it honestly if you have that. If you love me, I'm happy. If you don't love me, I'm not happy. We, we get that from infancy because that's the way that God designed infants was if, a, if a, an infant has a warm and loving and steady and, and constant mother, she feels good inside. She feels like you're going to be here, and she feels happy. And when mother's not consistent or mother's not loving or she's not warm or, what, or, or, she's, not, or she's not warm or she is not loving, yeah, I said that right, all of a sudden the baby feels scared or anxious or not good inside, like something's wrong here. The baby thinks, uh-oh, there's a signal. But the way that God made us is over time, the baby internalizes the, the warmth and the soothing and the comfort and the steadiness, and that becomes a part of her, and she doesn't need it so much from mother. And then she turns two or three, and she acts like she doesn't need anything from mother. And then she turns 13, and that's when you have to call the police because now she doesn't think she needs anything from anybody, and on and on and on. Point, be, point being, all of us had at some point that regressive wish. If the person in my life loves me, everything's okay. If they don't, 
Everything's not okay. And that is something that's got to be addressed and dealt with. Because until you have dealt with your dependency and your regressive wishes with your button pusher, you will become an obsessive, compulsive fanatic whose only goal in life is to hope that button pusher turns around. And that is not a separate, free life. Who's free? Nobody's free. Well, the button pusher's free. But you're not free. You know, one of the things that I, I really like about talking, and Henry and I have talked about this many years, about to a Monday Night Solutions group, is that people come here for like a million different reasons. You know, some people come here because, you know, movies are expensive. Some people come because they've just had a loss and they don't have anybody in their life that can explain loss to them. Some people come because they're in a, a crisis. Some come because there's some relationship that's just not working like they want, to, want, want it to work. But what I really have always liked is that when people come here, they're wanting to go one level below what you can see. That's really cool. That's what, that's what becoming a growing person is about. I've got a lot of friends who, you know, just like just people I run into at work or in the neighborhood or whatever, who have no idea about what we're talking about. There's like, there's no idea. I can't even explain it to them. I've got a guy I work with in, in, a, in another, another avenue of life, and I'll tell him what I'll do, and he'll say, why do you do this? And why do you say these things like process and relationship and dysfunction? I'll say, I'll say, this is how I look at life. He'll go, I know, this is crazy. I said, well. And I can remember when I didn't know these words and these concepts. Some of you are coming in tonight saying, I don't know these words. How are you talking about relationship and process and dysfunction and brokenness? All I wanted to do was, you know, find somebody to love and settle down and have a good job and go to church and have a few vacations every now and then. Now we're talking about dysfunction. The reality is, though, is that real life is when you go below the surface and realize that even good relationships deal with the issue of freedom. The great themes like freedom and love and spirituality and loss and conflict and honesty and you may not have any kind of serious problem, but it's really cool to get around people who have reclaimed their happiness and decided, I'm going to get below just, you know, having a good life. I want to have what Jesus called the abundant life. And it's really great because I see, I guess, in the questions and in the struggles of people, you guys want more. I mean, it just always really grabs me that you want more than just kind of like, whatever you thought normal life was. And sometimes it was a loss that did that, or sometimes it was a, a person that did that, a relationship or whatever. But that's, to me, what life is really about, is getting beyond a good, kind of normal, comfortable life and getting into what's real. Because even those people out there that you look at, you go, why can't I be like them? They got 2.5 children in a picket fence. You know, and they go to Hawaii and they have a good church and all this sort of thing. I promise you, they've been in my office. Something's wrong with everybody. There's a great comfort in that. Then I mean, kind of like equalizes the playing field. You look out there and you go, they look better, but I bet they're screwed up. Too. <laughs> I don't know. It's just kind of comforting thought. Um, also, your growth changes both of you. Your growth changes both of you. You know, if you do what we're talking about, which is what the Bible says, which is to find God and follow Him and start changing your ways and be a better person and all that, you're going to change. You're going to like become more honest and more vulnerable and more emotionally accessible and, you know, more open and more truthful and more accepting of yourself and other people. And you will also be that with that other person. And that will change that other person because there's a principle of light and darkness that the, the, the Gospel of John talks about in chapter 1 where it says that the dark, there's darkness is out here. I mean, how many of you saw Lord of the Rings? Okay. You know, and how 
mortar and the darkness were spreading and, you know, the forces of evil were, you know, so huge. And there's, that's kind of like the way it is in the world. And that when people decide, I'm going to get serious about growth and God and all that, they start putting the darkness back in its place. And that's kind of one of our jobs here on earth. We have lots of jobs. That's one of them is to put, put the darkness back into containment. And it says in, in the Bible that the darkness could not comprehend the light. It doesn't understand it. So you're with a button pusher, and they're crazy, or they're out of control, or they're frustrating you, they're making you mad, they're breaking your heart, they're lying to you, they're deceptive, whatever they do, they're creative people. And you start changing and saying, I, I know you do that, that's right, I've accepted that you do that, I'm going to do this from, from now on. All of a sudden, you're light, and they can't manipulate light. And it frustrates them, they don't know what to do. They, they, how do you control them? How do they control you? Like... The eternal um, uh, uh, kind of teenager person that's always like, you know, screws up and, you know, does irresponsible things and you confront them and they go, oh, you're just, you know, you're, you're no fun. You're just kind of a fuddy-duddy. And you know they're trying to provoke you into getting mad. I've taught people before when, when their teenager who's 42 years old in their life does that, then they go and they say, you just don't want me to have fun. You're just kind of like, you know, so boring. You say things like, you're probably right. I might need to go, like, take a don't be boring class or something. Let me think about that. And then they're getting ready for the fight so they can blow off, you know, and then get mad and then go use drugs and say it was your fault. And you just went, good point. You were light. They had nobody to fight. So you get the power out of it when you become a growing person. And then thirdly, become what you requ request. Become what you request. request. You know, there's kind of a law of fairness here. You got somebody you want to grow up? What should you do? Grow up. You got somebody you want to be more emotionally available? Be emotionally available. You got somebody you want to connect with you at a deep level? Be that person. You got somebody you want to be trustworthy so that you know that they're who they are and they're being honest with you and authentic with you and like what we would call an integrated person with you? Be that person. Become what you request the other person to be. I've just seen so many times where, and not in a mean way or anything, but where a person begins to change and realizes, you know, I've been like the nagger or I've been kind of the nice Susie compliant, not saying anything, or I'm just trying to be loving and I never could set a limit. And then they, they decide, you know, I haven't been honest and yet I'm... I've been telling him to be honest, but I've never told him how I felt. And so all of a sudden they say how I f they felt, and they say, it really hurts my feelings when you do this. When you're like negative with me, you dismiss my feelings. I, I just don't like it. I'm not going to put up with it. Now you're becoming what you want that person to be, which is someone who's honest with how he or she is feeling. It's a really good thing. Because all of a sudden, you're changing the power moves, and you're changing the dynamics back and forth, and the rules are different. So that same sick dance that we do goes away because you're becoming the person. And here's the kind of like, I don't know, the added benefit, maybe more than that, is that when you become what you're requesting, you don't care as much. You don't care whether they get it or not in it. You want them to. But it's sort of like not the point anymore. You start realizing, you know, I've been focusing, if my world is a pie, I've been focusing on this one slice called a crazy person. I got seven other slices here, and they're really pretty good because I'm feeling more power, and I'm feeling more alive, and I'm feeling more free, and I've got love from people I never thought I would get love from, and I'm picking people better, and I've got meaningful activities, and here I am in the process of growth, and I'm finding God at a deeper level. You don't care as much. They can get better. They can get worse, but you're no longer on that roller coaster. You're a steady person all the way through as you help them to get steady. Isn't that a good thing? Don't you want to be steady so you don't have to wake up every day saying, gosh, I hope they're better because I'll have a good day. It's sort of like, I'm going to have a pretty good day because I've got God and some really cool people and some things I'm doing and I'm finding out some things about myself and there's some interesting things going on in me. I'm steady Eddie. And steady Eddie doesn't really need your button pusher to change. But the funny thing about that 
is that that's what helps the button pusher change. Because they got nobody else to provoke and to blame and to say, see what you did anymore. How do you get mad at Steady Eddie? Steady Eddie isn't having tantrum. Steady Eddie isn't like screaming. Steady Eddie, Steady Eddie is just saying, I told you I was going to do this and you know I did and so have a nice day. It really helps change the button pusher. And then the next resource is um, other people. Other people. Um, you know, you want a miracle. We all want miracles if we've got somebody we're dating or married to or in our family. We all want a miracle for that person to change. And here's the miracle. A lot of times, some people in your life are the angels that God sent. They're the miracle. I cannot tell you the power of having the right kind of people around you, surrounding you, and giving you sanity and clarity and identification, and I've been there. And they do it in two different ways. And the first one, where it says for life and growth, you need other people not to deal with your button pusher directly. I'll deal with that in a second. But indirectly through you. you got to have people that are your, your team, your cheerleaders. They may never speak to your button pusher. Now, sometimes that happens. But these people may never encounter your button pusher because of the circumstances, but they're the people that you fill up with. The people that go, I get it. I understand. I've been there. Tell me more. And they're the people that will help you grow. They'll tell you the truth sometimes when you don't want to hear it. Or they'll say, you know, you kind of blew it then. You shouldn't have written that check. Or you should have spoken up then. Or you probably shouldn't have used that knife. That wasn't a good idea. Or little things that help you with perspective. But they'll also be there with no condemnation, with no judgment, with no shame. That's who you need to pick. Jim was talking earlier about how there's going to be a teaching on Henry and my book, Safe People. And one of the things about safe people is they don't have an ounce of condemnation or the parental position with you because that will shut you down like that. If you feel like there's a kind of a spiritual parent, you know, putting you down, nobody can use that. That, that brings the law in. What we need is people who want to be there with us. See, some of us pick people that are like the advice freaks. You know, how's your day? Not really good. Well, here's three cues to have a good, good day. You see, uh, first you take your nice and then you bike 20 miles. and then, Well, that's nice, but I tend to run away from people like that. I mean, I've had my share of advice people in my life, and I know what they look like now, and I avoid them. Because basically, they violate a biblical principle that says to a person who gives an answer before he hears the question, it's a foolish and a folly. It has folly to it. It is a folly and a shame to him. And so the advice givers are basically working on anxiety. They're trying to not feel anxious by your problem. So if they give you three points to follow, then they won't feel nervous. It doesn't help you at all, but they feel better. The second group is the people that are kind of like, they want, they'd like to hear good news. You ever been around people who just want to hear good news from you? And like when you give them bad news, they kind of move away. Like, oh, no, here you are again. And so you say, God, the marriage stinks. And they go, but... You still married? <laughs> you go, yeah, that's why I'm miserable. Let's try this again. If I was divorced, I'd be saying I'm happy today. So, like, you're not helping me. But it's really bad, you know. He doesn't get it. And he's like, you know, really disconnected. And they'll go, not a murderer, is he? You go, yeah, but I'm going to be one really soon. <laughs> and, you know, the, the kind of have to have a happy ending people. They're just kind of, they're nice people. I mean, I'd go to a Disney movie with them, I guess. Because they could guess the ending. Aside from that, I don't have a lot of use for it. Because what, how am I going to bring a problem? I want somebody who can be there in the swamp and the snot and the blood and say, wow. I want somebody who, when I start telling them how bad it is, they lean forward, <laughs> not away. And they go... Tell me more, because there's enough grace in them, and there's enough experience in them, and there's enough love. They say, you don't want to be alone with this. I want to be with you in this. How many of you got people like that? 
they're not on every street corner. Because some people just want to give advice and some people want a good ending. But get with people who say, I've, I've suffered and I want to hear yours because I'm your buddy. And I want to hear as bad as it gets, I'm here with you. They're the people who will save you. And the other part of that is not only will they save you, but once they have heard you at a deep level and you know they get me, and they've really paid attention, and they've paid the price, and they've listened to all this stuff, and they know who I am, they're also going to tell me the truth. And they're also going to say, you know, I've, I've earned the right to say this, but there's a couple of corrections I'd make here. You've really let him get away with too much, or you've really put up with some stuff you shouldn't with her, or, you know, you gave all your power to her. What well, was the goony thing to do? And you can't, make, you can't say, well, you don't get it because they just spent you know, a couple of hours getting it. So let them earn the right, and then you be humble enough to say, I listen to you. Those are the best friends in the world, and they will change you. And I can think of so many instances in my life where people took the time to get it, and then, then I wanted to stop because I you know, blamed for two hours. I felt good. And I want to say, okay, that's great. Maybe I'll meet you next week. And they go, ho, 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 I just earned this. Sit down, shut up. It's my turn. And I didn't like what came later, but it saved me. I heard some things that hurt my feelings, but it saved me. And I heard some things that I didn't want to do that were uncomfortable, but it saved me. And I heard things like, you know, you weren't emotionally honest then, or you put up with something you shouldn't have, or you were pretending something that you weren't, well, wasn't true, or you weren't being authentic. Or you were judging like you're being judged. Or you were, you know, whatever. And that wasn't fun. I mean, when I'm in those situations, I, I finish my latte very quickly. But if you tolerate that with a person who's earned it, you'll be saved. You'll be changed. Then you go to your personal delta force. Now, that's just kind of a, my little cheesy way of talking about people that are not just in interaction with you, about you and your growth and supporting you and, you know, we're on your side, but also people who could be in interaction with that person because sometimes that is very important. Maybe this is like a relative that gets it, you know, and says, I'll, I'll talk to him too. Or like I've got a friend here at the church who does a lot of counseling. He's a pastor. And in those situations when I've had somebody... Uh, like a referral with a problem, I'll say, you know, can you see this couple? Because I'm telling them something here, and she's, she thinks that I'm like crazy. He'll go, yeah, I'll talk to him. And he says the same thing. I tell him exactly what to say, and that works. Um, <laughs> but, you know, like the more a person hears the same message from other people, the more power it has, because a lot of, a lot of times you, as the button push E, the pushy gets negated, right? You get neutralized. Whatever you say, they don't believe. Oh, you're making it up, or you're after me, or whatever, or you don't count. They've got to hear some kind of a Greek chorus of seven or eight other people that go, yeah, you are being jerky. Yeah, you are being like, you know, totally self-centered. Yeah, you really are. We love you, but you're doing that. That's your delta force. In Matthew 18, it talks about it. You know, if your brother sins, go to, go to him. If you repent, you've won your brother. If he doesn't repent, bring two or three, then bring the whole church. There's kind of a law of escalating voices that some people need. In psychology, we call it a formal intervention. Talk to somebody over the holidays who had to do an intervention on her son. And she and her husband and their other daughters, they had two daughters and and one out-of-control son, and then um, his best friend, and I think his boss, like all got together and did this really tough, tough intervention. But he went into treatment, changed his life. Because there's something about having people that are all saying the same thing that has incredible, incredible power. I mean, I've seen people really defensive, narcissistic, like totally nothing's ever my fault, out of control people break like a sapling breaks, just crack and begin to weep because they looked around and everybody that they loved 
or cared about was saying, you're a problem. And the love that they felt, along with the truth that they had been hiding from, broke them. And it's one of the most profound and powerful things I've ever seen. You might need a Delta Force. Somebody who loves that person enough to say, yeah, I'll have lunch with them too. Or maybe we'll do something even more, you know, rigorous. Sometimes that's necessary, depending on the situation and the circumstances. Um, and then how and where to plug in. Well, the reason that section's there is because a lot of us just don't know how to <clears throat> pick healthy people. You know, we've just been... Our radar is just kind of a mess. And so I want to give you a couple of things to be thinking about. about if, if you, you know, the people I described, like the ones that come into you when you start talking about problems and not away, and the ones that will be there with you and listen to it and, and pull it out of you and at the same time tell you the truth. Let me tell you a couple of things. They'll sort of like tell you how and when to plug in. First, find a context where problems are normal. Problems in life are normal, not problems are the exception. Because there are some people to whom life shouldn't have problems. They can't talk about problems. They don't know what to say about problems except, well, stop that. Thank you very much for that. Stop that. Never thought of that. And get around people that go, yeah, life's problems. Find Find churches or groups or people that you know who have experience because there's, a, you know, we're fortunate to live in this, I don't know, this segment of history right now where it's more and more okay to talk about things. I mean, if you watch enough Oprah and Dr. Phil and listen to Dr. Laura enough, you know that, you know, there's 19,000 million people talking about problems now. It's a bigger segment than it used to be. So find out people that kind of have the language of problems, but next to that, that they have, and this is going to sound obvious, but you have to say it, they have answers. They have answers. Because there are answers. When, when Henry and I wrote um, the book, God Will Make a Way, one of the things that we were scratching our heads about starting to write it, because it was about what do you do when you don't know what to do and you're out of crisis and don't know which way to go, was we knew that there were nine billion problems people have, right? From a bad habit to a bad behavior to an attitude thing to an emotional thing to a relational thing to a career thing, all that. But the path is always the same. You just fit the path into the problem. And so many people think, well, no, it's just, I just, you know, nobody really has answers and we'll just be together on this big life raft that's going down the rapids and we'll just look at each other and sing Kumbaya as it goes down. And, but that's not the way it is. Get people who have been around crazy people and say, oh, you have that particular, you have a raspberry crazy person. Here's what you do about them. Oh, you have the tangerine crazy person. Here's what you do about them. There's a different answer. Because crazy people and button pushers are come in different flavors, and there are different flavors of answers. There really are answers. Anything from a certain way to address them, to a certain limitations you put with them, to a certain way you change your behavior. Get around people who are saying, oh, yeah, we've seen that. We know what we're talking about. People that... Problems don't scare them. They eat problems for breakfast, as they say. And people who say there's answers for problems. Those are going to be the people who are the safest and the sanest and the ones who will bring you the most help. So, just to review our first three resources, God and all of his power and all of his principles, your own life as you get out of the I need for you to make me happy and get into, well, Hope you do, but I'm going to be happy anyway. And other people who matter to you. Enough to listen to you, enough to tell you the truth. And these go a long way to changing as a byproduct that button pushers because you can't stand the light for very long. We know that a lot of people come because either they've got an issue or a problem or something they've never faced before. And we want to let you know that we... Um, we get this material, Henry and I do, um, from the Bible, and it speaks of the Christian faith. 
We want to make sure that you know what the Christian faith is and what the elements of it are because a lot of times there's some kooky ways of explaining what a Christian is and we don't want you to have that because we don't think that's the right thing. That a Christian is, is not somebody who's good or does moral things or helps out or has a spiritual life or anything. That's just not what a Christian is. A Christian is a very, very specific thing. It's a person who knows that they have sinned and fallen from God. They know and accept the reality that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and they've asked Jesus to be their Savior. Period. In Stop. It is no more complicated than that, though we hear many people saying it's more complicated. That's all the Bible says. I've sinned. Jesus died to save me. I ask him to be my Savior. And if you're not a Christian or you're kind of thinking about these issues and not sure, we'd like to invite you to think about that. And I'm going to close in a prayer. And I'm going to pray um, those three realities in that prayer. And if this is something you'd like to do to make sure that you know God in a personal way, I invite you to pray silently with me. And um, if there's any question you have about that, there's people out there that can talk to you about the next step. So let's, let's close and pray. God, we... Um, we ask for that person that hurts us or drives us crazy or whatever, and we ask for answers because you, you do have answers and you have provided them. We know also that we've been your button pushers and that we have walked from you and not owned who we were. And we say to that, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I've missed the mark. God, we also know that Jesus... His purpose and his goal was not just to be a teacher or be a model or example. That His purpose was a, a death and a sacrifice. And that's more important than any of this. And that his death and sacrifice paid for my sins so that I did not have to pay for them myself. And I accept that death to substitute for my sins and my own guilt. Knowing that if I do this, and in my heart I believe that Jesus has risen from the dead and that he is in my heart, that forever the gates of heaven are open and I'm in the family of God with no fear and no insecurity, knowing that I'm in relationship with you and all of your resources for all time. Be with us now this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks a lot. See you next week.